Now imagine if hundreds of thousands of people wanted to be plumbers and technicians in the trade. You know that technician that no call, no show through two, three times, and he's still working for you because you don't have nobody else? That guy would be gone and be replaced with a better person. That's what we need to focus on as a whole, not just as next gen. We all unite and say the same thing. Hey, guys, come and join us. This is where the money's at. This is where the future's at. This is where good culture is at. And we start getting an influx of people applying, the trades would be a whole different world. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your host, Nate and Brian, hanging out with you on this fine new week. And we are excited to invite Ishmael Valdez onto the show. That's right. The owner and CEO of NextGen himself is joining us today. It is going to be a great, exciting, and motivating conversation. Really looking forward to this one, Brian. And as always, we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing the idea for ourselves before we get into the interview. And we're going to turn to Brian for a quote. The key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your very best. Epictetus. I don't know who that is, but I love that quote. He's a Greek, he's a Greek, he's a Greek philosopher. Uh, That would explain that. He was like, like born into slavery and then banished from Greece and like, or from like island to island. He's a, he's, he's got a great story and it's weird because he's, if you read up on him, his life didn't seem great, you know, but a lot of great writings came from him. Just as he's a stoic philosopher. Nice. Well, there's nothing stoic about the guests that we're having on today. No, sir. And he is zero stoicism. uh, (laughs) He's going to be talking about that same idea of being around people, creating that culture of people that is uplifting. But how, how on point is that though? Like we toured Ishmael's shop. What? Yes, we did. A year and a half ago. Uh, Yeah, in the middle of COVID in California, no no big deal. Yeah, good times. No (laughs) masks here. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we toured Ishmael's shop, and um, was that 2022? Yeah, a year and a half ago. 21. Sorry, yeah, 21. And um, all we saw were, were, you know, it it can be hard to know how to take Ish, especially if you're in, like, if you're in his uh, Facebook group, because he says some things that are, pretty off the wall and and things that if you just take them at face value you're like this makes no sense whatsoever from a business strategy standpoint but typically when he breaks them down a little bit you realize he's not exactly saying what he said he's just he's very uh, innovative for sure and he's he's coming at things from a slightly different point of view from the norm and it's how he built you know in seven years built a company from zero to what? He's over a hundred million. Over a hundred million. Over a hundred million in seven years. And I would say the main way he did that, as I talk to people I know who work for him or have worked for him, two in particular that I respect immensely, one being Daniel Arroyo's, it's culture. Like one of the other person that I know I'm not going to mention because I didn't, He's not there anymore, and I didn't ask if it was okay, but had said things about where he worked before-ish. And, you know, this is a highly esteemed place to work and good people, and he said that, you know, despite being a, a producer and, and um, you know, always a high producer while he was there, the leadership there barely knew his name. And he said that if he, if he you know, calls in, says you know i'm not going to be there in the morning next thursday i got a you know doctor's appointment for my kid or something like he'll he can expect a phone call from ish personally hey man everything okay you good like he just builds that kind of culture and has that kind of relationship with his people that like he knows everything about them and it was shocking to hear this because that's tough to do at a 40 million dollar company 
let alone one that's, you know, two and a half times that size. For sure, Brian. And it's something that so many companies lose sight of because of the growth, right? You know, and, and all these layers and all these policies and all this stuff gets put into place and it's practical. It makes sense. It's operational and all that. But you lose touch. You lose touch with people. You don't remember names anymore. And, and all this happens. And it's at the sacrifice. Growth so many times is at the sacrifice of culture. Yeah, man. I was on a, I was watching uh, Tommy do, Tommy Mello do a live, uh, what is that live podcast he does every now and then? Just goes live, I guess, and answers questions on Facebook Live. And he was saying he spent like a total of two full weeks home last year. I'm pretty, or maybe it was this year, but either way, like two full weeks home outside of all the traveling and speaking he does. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds like just a total nightmare. And he doesn't have any kids, and I don't think he and Bree are married yet. I'm sure that's coming, but uh, but he said he's going to spend more time home this year because his people that work with him deserve his time, energy, and effort. Love it. And, uh, yeah, he's got the same kind of thing with the culture for these two is, is it. It all starts and ends there. And then everything else comes behind that. And it's that concept of the culture being the, the tip of the spear, so to speak, that drives people to the business. It attracts them is the magnet that brings in talent. Yeah. And the, the one thing we toured, uh, Tommy shop as well last year and the one thing we could say about both places it's a whole bunch of people you don't mind being around like they're, they're it's just everywhere you went it was people smiling fist bumps were were plenty and everyone was like excited to be doing what they're doing and driven and talking about the future and you know the difference between win and winners and losers according to zig ziglar winners walk around all day talking about what they want Losers walk around all day talking about their problems. That's it. That's the major difference between the two. Yeah, so good. And these two places we visited were all about people walking around talking about their goals. Right, and it's not a show either because, you know, that wears off. Like, nobody can maintain the show for more than, you know, a couple months, if that, couple weeks in reality. And, and we talked about even our own people here that have come here, and we believe we have a, a solid culture as well. They say they're they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like they're just waiting for the real face to show itself, and all of a sudden, all the goodness falls away. Yeah, that that's actually said quite often here. They, from everywhere I came from, I kept waiting for this uh, facade to wear off, and for you guys to be who you truly are. But who we truly are here is a bunch of people who got fed up working at those kind of places and said, "Let's do something different here." That's it. So if people get are super negative and complainers and always find a reason something can't work. They don't make it past the interview. And then if they did make it past the interview and we realize that that's who they are, they get moved out pretty quickly because the teams just don't have any patience for that here. It's well said, Brian. And that's why we wanted to have a podcast that's focusing on culture. And many of you may not necessarily be the one at the top of the pyramid uh, defining what culture is, but every one of you is a part of culture. And we each have the responsibility, the burden, and you know, preferably the opportunity to impact the culture for the good. And that's something that, you know, we stand behind here because it's not enough to just have one man standing on the street shouting and saying, let's have good culture. It takes the team and the team replenishing the team and the team replenishing the team and so on from there. And so it's, it's important that we each play the role in that, that we are called to do and be the positive good ourselves. It's time now for our review of the week. And we're going to turn to Brian for that. Best ever. Amazing. Five stars. I am blown away by the guests and the interviews. Mr. Reply All. Mr. Reply All? That's the name. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe there's a story there, but I like it. Thank you for that, Mr. Reply All. And we hope that you are replying all to this podcast and sharing it around. Yep. We appreciate you. We appreciate the review and the kind words. And if anyone wants to help the show grow, jump on Apple Podcasts, click right review, hit the five star button and uh, say what's up or just hit the five star button. And uh, we really appreciate it because that's how the show grows. And if you like the show and you listen every week, you want the show to grow because that's how we get um, bigger guests on frankly if you're on if you're on spotify you can just hit the five star button 
If you're on any other platform listening, write a Facebook post, Instagram, whatever, tag one of us in it and uh, tell us what you think of the show. Absolutely, Brian. And it's time now to put Ishmael Valdez in your passenger seat. Ishmael Valdez is our guest today. He is a man on a mission as the owner of the number one HVAC company in Southern California. Next Gen has grown to become an impressive family owned and operated business by sticking to the basics, superior customer service, data efficiency, and a highly trained staff of technicians and contractors. Ishmael's journey started out as a young aspiring HVAC technician over 15 years ago, and he hasn't forgotten his roots. Valdez believes in the family unit and treats every customer like they are part of his own. His continued commitment to fairness and dedication to core values has helped his business grow exponentially. It's undeniable that Valdez has made an impact on the industry, his drive to continually improve services and customer care, along with the support of his next-gen family, has led an additional 10 locations in Southern California. We are proud to have Ishmael join the show today. Welcome here, Ish. What's up, guys? How are you? What's up, man? Good to talk to you again. Uh, first and foremost, I feel a, a weight of uh, gratitude to uh, send your way because I don't know what that was like two years ago now. You were yeah, great, man, gracious I, enough I, to have Nate and me out to visit your shop in LA and you gave us very generously of your time to a couple guys that you had never met before and then your management team as well spent like hours with us and, and it was very enlightening for us so we really appreciate that yes thank you come to the net to the to the to the new shop it's it's literally like 98 percent done already they're doing some dry wants some custom painting and all that but you guys need to come back it's it's a totally different next gen than what you guys um what you guys visited last time last time well, i hope it's not too too different because i'll tell you man your staff was um you know they were playful. They were busy, but playful, and just seemed to really, oh, yeah. really enjoy themselves above most places I've ever been to. And and were very um, even. You know, and I'll be frank. When I visit a shop, I like to grab a technician out of the parking lot and say, "Give me the real. You know, give me the skinny. How do you like it here?" And that can go either way. But for you, for your shop, uh, I grabbed two guys in a hallway who were, I guess, new lead installers, and they were just as uh, frank as everyone else about how. The culture there is more like a bunch of friends hanging out than anything else. So that, that's good though, because I do the same thing to people that, that, that like right now. There's a ton of employees out there that I haven't met that I'm still you know introducing myself to, and, and they've been there a week, a month, a, you know, four or five months or whatever. And I always introduce myself, and the first thing I the first thing I always ask the guys, I always ask two questions when I when I introduce myself. You know, I'm like, hey man, how do you guys like it here? How do they treat you here? And, 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 and everybody says the same thing, man, these managers are so cool. Ishmael. I've never worked at a place like this. My second question I always ask them is, are you making money? Right. And I always ask them that. And I look them straight in the eye. I'm like, are you making money? And they're, they, every single one of them has been like, I've never made this much money in my life. Ishmael. So that's all I care about. If they're happy and they're making money so they could pay their bills, so they could make their goals, so they could, you know, whatever it is that they're going to use it for. I did my job. Awesome. And what else is there? Honestly, what else is there? If they feel fulfilled oh, man, there, and they're making great so, money, what else is there? There's so much in there that like, dude, dude, what I, what I love that what I've been discovering about myself the last year, the last couple of years now that I've been, you know, kind of analyzing the business more from afar is I actually get more gratitude. I actually get more fulfillment when I, when I sit down with these people or I see them like, you know, passing by and they're, they're on their phone and they're smiling or they're talking to their wives on their phone or, or, you know, they're, 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 they're just the energy that they bring off in the building or when I see them in the parking lot or when I see them at a at Starbucks, wherever I see them and they have good energy, you know, it, 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 it all starts with, with, with being at home, uh, being at home, happy, number one, number two, being at work, happy, right? Both, both have as equal, uh, as equal power to your energy as, 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 as each other does. Right. So I always do, I always try to make sure that I feel people's energy. I, 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 I give them a quick interview. I ask them a couple of questions. I make sure that they're doing good. And if they're not, if I see that they have, you know, they're down a little bit or, you know, they're struggling or whatever it is, I make sure that I bring it up to their manager. So I'm still, I'm, I'm still pretty involved in it, right? Man, Dr. Jordan Peterson was, uh, he, he did a lecture recently. You know who Jordan Peterson is? I love that guy, bro. Okay, I yeah, love yeah. that guy. I follow that guy on Instagram and on Facebook. I love that guy. So for those who are uh, behind the times enough to not know who he is, he's a clinical psychologist, writer, I mean, author, and speaker. He's just a beast. Uh, he was saying that they had done um, surveys like 
uh, decades of surveys, and they found that when a parent of a child works late and comes home late every night, it has almost zero effect on that child's happiness and adjustment. But when a parent comes home even early from a job they hate, that child's development is slower and they tend to be more uh, of an angry child. That is, and thank you for telling me that because that, that is super, super dope, man. Like, I'll send you that clip. All, that, that, thank you. Please do, Brian. And, and, and we all know the trade is hard. It's not like it's going to walk in the park, right? But, but like it's worth every freaking ounce of energy that you guys pour in the trade. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Worth, worth every second because of the people like, well, like yourself, like, and let's get into your story, like myself, who, who came from, you know, a single parent family in Detroit and no high school diploma and made it to where I am. And so many people who work for us who have had these opportunities that they're not getting somewhere. Like you're not going to a hospital with no high school diploma and becoming a doctor. Hell, no. It's not happening. No, you're not. But you can come to the trades and make doctor money. Or more. Yeah. And you don't have all the insurance to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll make doctor money or more. You'll make that lawyer money or more. So it's, uh, well, it's, let's start with culture here, because, you know, that's something that you have promoted for a long time and still do, uh, specifically in next gen. It, what is this culture that you speak of? Do you just have like free sodas and ping pong tables everywhere? Is it just a party all day or is there no, a lot of work no, getting no, done? No, no. It's a lot of work getting done, man. It's a lot of work. But but like you, when 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 you get focused two into work for two, three, four, five hours straight, you, you, you wear off quick, man. So what I do is I try to come in the shop and I try to give a little bit different energy. You know, I'll go, I'll go to the shop for a couple hours in the morning and make sure everybody's good. And, you know, they get their, themselves situated, getting ready for work. I go work out and then I come back and I bring another set of energy. You know, dude, the culture is not just giving out, you know, free sodas and, and free meals and all that. It's, it's the Kamar, it's the, it's the friendships. It's the, it's the relationships that get built inside the, the, the the operation every single day whether it's frustration because of calls whether it's, for, it, it's happiness because we're hitting our goals like all those roller coasters of emotions and all those roller coasters of 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 of, of people being happy being frustrated being mad being happy again like all that is what creates a bond between all these people look the reason why people want to work at next is, is yes we have amazing pay yeah, yes, we treat you very, very well. Like the reason why people love working there is because of the people inside the operation. It's not, it's not because we, you know, we give out free gift cards. Yeah, that's all cool. Everybody does that now. Everybody has a little arcade inside their, their shop now. Everybody's like beginning to, you know, step, step up their game on their shop and making sure that the, like the vibe is good. Like everybody could do that. But the one thing that like makes next gen next gen is like the people inside there. They're so unique, man. They're so cool. Everybody has a different story. Everybody comes from different side of the, of the, of the, of the universe, right? Even of, of the United States. Or, or country and all those stories when once you start like you know spending two three hours with them or spending hours at a time with them and learning all that that's what creates the bond and that's what creates those those those, those that, that's what keeps those people inside the operation nice and glued you know what i'm saying it's it's those special moments that we celebrate and it's those those frustrating moments that that, that we that we overcome that's what makes next gen next gen it's so good and it's something that i'm i know you are passionate about but were you always passionate about it i mean We'd like to ask our, the, the people that we have on the show here to tell us a little bit about their background on how they got into everything. So what's your story? Dude, and before we get in there, Brian, I want to I want to congratulate you guys, dude, for keeping up with this podcast, because there's a lot of people I see online, on social media, on Facebook, on, on Instagram, everywhere. And I see them and they start a podcast. They do two, three episodes. They don't get whatever they were looking for. And then they stop. And I got to congratulate you guys, man, because that is so freaking dope that you guys kept up this long doing your podcast. You guys have really good people in there. I've seen some of the people that you guys interview and it is super dope, man. I'm, I do that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud and I'm honored to be on this podcast. So oh, thanks a lot, man. We, my- we, we uh, really appreciate that feedback. And, uh, we actually just hit our two year mark and, um, it, it is difficult. We understand completely why people drop off because I was just saying this to a, uh, a a listener who texted us a kind of a cool congratulations the other day that, you know, it's every day we walk into here, we have a thousand things that we need to be doing instead. I mean, I'm vice president of sales, Nate's vice president of operations. And we come, we head in here to do this. And it's like, we have to get off our phones, shut the iPads down and just give the the guest our attention for an hour. And it's like, 
it's tough. But then we, we read these reviews of people who get a lot out of it. And it's like, okay, we owe this to the trades that have been so I, kind it, to it, us. It, that is so fun. That is so dope, man. Honestly, I uh, thank you for doing that because I, I, I could see the impact on the, on, on the trades on having podcasts like this. And like I said, not a lot of people will do it. So I, before I start with my story, I gotta, gotta thank you guys for doing this and keeping up with it because it's super dope to have consistency on the, on the podcast. And I know that you guys got a ton of listeners. I look forward to this. So hopefully they get something out of my podcast and, you know, hopefully I help them out in some kind of way. Uh, no, no question about that. You absolutely will. All right, we appreciate it, Ish. So uh, let's let's hear your side of the story, dude. I, I was uh, I, I won't go as far. I won't give you the sob story of you know what happened to me when I was young and you know, how I lost my parents and all that. I'll start off when when I got into the trades. I got into the trades when I was um, I think I was seventeen, sixteen. I recently got kicked out of my house and I didn't know where to work at. I, I was working at an auto supply house. Um, we were you know a distributor that were just in the warehouse making little to no money on it. Um, on a, it was like on a Friday night. I was going to, um, uh, we were going to go out to a party. I'm 17 years old. You know, I got a little bit of money on my, on my pockets and I'm on my way to, um, one of the stores just to buy a, a shirt, right. So to go out that night. And I passed by this distributor called Howard industry and it said now hiring. And I'm like, you know what? I got a little bit of time to spare. Let me go in there and freaking apply. Hopefully they give me a buck more, a couple bucks more and I'll, you know, uh, I make a little bit more money. When in there applied, I talked to Richard for like, you know, no more than 10 minutes. Guys like, dude, is there any way you could start on Monday? I love your energy. I love who you are. You know, I love uh, the, the quick background that I told them. Um, you know, I have a great memory. Um, I'm, I'm very, very hardworking. I'm very, very consistent with my, my with my hard work. And he just told me, he's like, man, if there's any way you could start on Monday, that would be amazing. So I did. You know, it was the, the other job that I had was a dead-end job. It really wasn't paying me anything. Um, so I did start on Monday. Was in the warehouse on, you know, for three months. Um, learned the parts, learned, I, I didn't know what a TY was. I didn't know what freaking you know, nothing, a connector coil, none of that was. Uh, so I learned all the parts there. I started, you know, um, I started really, really building relationships with the contractors. And just to give you a scope of what, what kind of contractors went to Howard industry. Um, most of those guys were anywhere between $500,000 a year to maybe $2 million tops. We had a couple contractors that were four to five million dollar contractors, and they were like the big guys there. And I always admired these people because day in day out they would come in every single morning. We would open up at six, I think, or seven, and they would come in, Brian, and they would order their equipment, their material. They would be, you know, they would be all hyped up. Their installers would meet them up at our supply house because some of these guys didn't have shops, or they were, you know, they were just they, they were just little mom and pop shops, you know. And, um, yeah, they just, they, they, I just built relationships with everybody, man. I started asking a million questions. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the, in the, in, in the room ever, but I do ask a million questions and I don't, and when I ask questions, I don't like to get half answers. I like to get the full answer. I like to get my full knowledge of it. So I started asking these guys questions. What do you guys do out there, man? Like, why do you guys pick up all these boxes and what do they do? Right. And then they started showing me contracts, bro. I'm like, Wait, these guys are paying like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars for all this material and equipment at the time, right? Now it's way more, but at the time, twelve, thirteen, fifteen hundred dollars for equipment, and they were selling it for five, six thousand dollars at the time. And I'm like, man, these guys are making money, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's when, I, and that's when I got, that's when I got hooked, man. I started asking more questions and more questions. I started going out with some of these contractors to to do sales calls. I started going out with some of these installers to do installs, but I've never really worked on the units. I would just, you know, look at how they would piece it all off. They would explain everything to me. You know, luckily I was, I was always really nice to these people. So they were always treating me with respect. And yeah, man, we just, you know, we started, you know, going to installs here, seeing how they sold it. See, I started seeing how it all like meshed together. And, uh, and, and that's how I got in there, man. Like, you know, I had a, uh, I had probably freaking job offers from these contractors every single day. There was, you know, two, three contractors coming up to the counter asking my boss if they could hire me, which I thought was the funniest thing in the world. And this, this was like an ongoing thing every single day. And, um, you know, this guy named Ken Starr, I think like in 2014 or 13 around there came up, came up to me and he, you know, we had a good relationship. And he finally, you know, he finally convinced me to leave that uh, to that distributor. You know, after what seven, eight years of being in there and that distributor, I was, you know, I was super happy there. I was making good money, 
And he convinced me to go to the other side of the counter. And uh, yeah, we blew up our first company. Um, I thought it was no big deal. I thought it was a normal thing. We grew our first company from zero to 20. I think we did 21 million in four years. We had 160 something employees. Uh, you know, at the time, I'm like, I didn't really think of anything. I just, you know, I was grinding, recruiting people, calling people, staffing it up. We're trying to learn the operation, you know, and he was out there doing the sales part of it build a dope sales team for us and i was the back end guy the operations guy and um yeah man i just i, I had a freaking blast with him 2016 comes around i think to that late 15 2016 comes around and you know he drives out of cash flow he's spending the money where he's not supposed to he's you know doing stupid decisions that some contractors do and you know and he, he made a ton of dumb decisions with his cash and uh dried out the business so you know he made some tough decisions let me go and i think a couple weeks later i started in action you know which was a blessing in disguise because for those two weeks i turned off my phone i hated the world i i thought he had taken advantage of me and you know i didn't know the full story of it and uh now looking back at it i'm like man you know what he just made a mistake man there's 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 no um i don't have any remorse towards him i actually actually you know when i when i think about him i pray for him so i don't it was it was it was a it was a blessing in disguise. I always say that because at the time for those two weeks, I hated the world. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I thought he betrayed me. I'm like, how could he have done this to me if I grew this company for him? Right? Out of 160 employees, I think I hired like 150 of them that were my people. So you know, I I, I left and I you know our first next gen was just going to be trying to figure out how to pay the bills and um and it turned out to a little bit more than that. So I'm I'm blessed, man. I I can't complain. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know that you've had success with NextGen. Tell us the story there. Dude, first year, I, I, I'll give you some numbers. I'm not trying to show off by any means. I just want, I love, uh, now that I look retrospect on how, what, like what we did at NextGen, because I'll take, you know, 1% credit for it. My team was 99% of what, what we did. But looking at the numbers, man, I'm like, I tell like Paul Kelly, like, uh, we're, uh, by the way, I'm over here in Vegas today. I'm overseeing the strip. I'm, you know, I'm here for the GOAT Awards, which is the Wrench Awards. Um, I'm part of uh, the Wrench Group, which is a private equity group. Um, they do this once a year, GOAT Awards in Las Vegas. You know, they bring in like four or 500 people from all of Wrench, from all the companies that they acquired, and they give out these dope awards of, you know, best sales guy, best installer, best technician, highest revenue, highest this. It's just really, really fun. This is my first year doing it, and I'm telling you, it's, it's it's probably one of the best experiences. So, so I'm, I'm I'm here talking to Paul Kelly, talking to Kenny Haynes, talking to Kevin Comer for for all the pe- for all the people that don't know those guys are two hundred million dollar companies, and I'm here like literally rubbing shoulders with these guys. So it feels dope, and I'm telling them stories of of when we used to when we started Next Gen and we were selling six thousand dollar systems, and you know how our first year we weren't running any any technician calls. We were running strictly sales over the phone sales. We were booking sales estimates only. People would call in and be like, hey, Ishmael, you know, hey, hey th- thank you for calling Next Gen. How can we help you? They're like, hey, you know, I got a five year old system that's not turning on. And we would tell them, we don't work on systems, we only sell them. <laughs> in the first like couple of years of Next Gen, it was the most insane thing to me now that I look back at it. We pulled it off, man. We had, you know, three sales guys. We did $9.8 million our first year. And, uh, and, and that's where this journey started, man. We, from there, just, it just went from 9.8 to 18.3 to 24 to 30 to I think uh, last year we did 100 101 million on our seventh year anniversary, which is um, pretty insane. And now that I talk to these guys that have been in the business for 20, 30 years, and they still can't believe the numbers that we pulled up at Next Gen. So pretty dope, man. It's you know God's God's been God's been really good to me. Uh, he's uh, he's never let me down. That's for sure. That's amazing, and absolutely uh, kudos to you guys for just hustling your way through it. You are absolutely right. There is many, many, many businesses that are in the trades and they stay level or barely grow for decades, right? It's, it's not they, easy they do. to do that. Hey, dude, and now that I look back at it, I think the, the, the Brian, and I, I don't think I've ever said this, I think the best, the, one of the best things that ever happened to me at NextGen growing that fast was because I didn't know anything. Like I thought what we were doing was normal. I'm like, everybody grows a $20, $30 million business, right guys? Like everybody's like, everybody's around this, you know what I'm saying? Like I never knew and I, and I never really paid attention to my numbers and I didn't have no fear of anything. So it was like, people would come in from a magazine company and be like, oh, you should try our magazine. It's home improvement guide. I'm like, yeah, try it. Hey, you should try our newspaper. Yeah, try that too. Hey, you should try this, um, the marketing camp, digital campaign. Oh, let me try that too. And I'm just saying yes to everything. 
everything without without tracking it, without knowing. I'm just, if it makes sense to me, I'm like, people look for air conditioning in a magazine back in the day, right? And they did. So I'm like, yeah, let's try it. And we put that in there. We put it at, in the newspaper and on Google. Like, it's just everywhere, man. And that's where the that's where the massive growth came about. It was, the, it was not knowing the fear of losing that because at the end of the day, I'm like, dude, I got my wife. I got my girls. I got, I'm healthy. They're healthy. We live a pretty dope life already. Like, if that's the worst that can happen to to me, then I'm okay with it. So for it's for every person that, you know, pursues risk taking, like you just mentioned there, for every success, there's probably dozens of failures of people who who miscalculated or overspent oh, or, or yeah. whatever, right? So what makes what makes you different? Like were you just a better calculator about which risks to take? Did it just happen no. to work out or, or did you work your way through it? Why why did it why did you end up at a hundred million dollars and twenty other people are bankrupt? It's because of the pivots that I would do so quick, man. It was because the mistakes that I made were so quick. Most people make a mistake and they think about that mistake. They try to analyze the mistake. They try to recover from the mistake. They try to like, they try, 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 try. And by the time they're trying, they're three, four, five, six months into that one mistake. Dude, I probably take five minutes of my time on that one mistake. And I learn from it and I pivot and I go the other way. That's the one thing that you guys got to realize. Like, in order for next gen to happen at a hundred million dollars in seven years, every single mistake that every contractor has ever made in the history of contracting was made at next gen, but it was made in a seven year span. It wasn't made in a 20, 30 year old, 30 year span that, that normal people would have taken, right? So it was those quick pivots of like trying this marketing company and they screwed us up. It wasn't the right marketing company. They were overcharging us, whatever it was, every excuse on the book, right? Not tracking my marketing properly. Didn't know how to use Service Titan properly. Complain to Service Titan about how what a piece of software they had. Like all that was compacted into a seven year span. But it was the it was the it was the it was the hey this is the mistake. Let's go the other way, right? Hey, we tried this magazine. It didn't work for six months. Cool. Let's drop that magazine. Move that money to something else that, that's working. And we kept doing that over and over. We hired a technician. The technician stole from us. You, you know how many people I hear like, oh, I don't want to hire this technician. He seems like a good guy. But what about he steals from me? What do you mean? Like, it's going to happen. It's not like it's like in every company. What about he takes one of my customers? What about if they do a side job on me? What about if they're stay taking material home? What like, dude, all that happens in every single company. But you can't let that fear of not hire. What about that guy's the best technician that you've ever hired? And he starts producing revenue that you've never even seen. What about that one sales guy's selling the highest average ticket in the world? Right. But you never know until you try them. And that's it. And that's that's what I keep telling people. You guys got to make decisions, man. You guys don't like stop thinking like, oh, I got to make the right decisions all the time. The right decisions all the time doesn't come every day, every hour, every minute. Yeah. Once in a while, you'll make a decision that changed the whole business. Example, in 2019, Tom, Tom Howard wrote, uh, goes to my shop after me complaining to service Titan of what a piece of software they have. They, they're trying to charge me at the time. They're trying to charge me like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. I'm running a $30 million business, right? I don't know my numbers. It, my my P&Ls, the, the chart of accounts on my P&Ls are out of whack. I'm not accounting for it properly. All, everything's been a company. But we're selling a ton of equipment. Culture's good. People are happy. People are making money, right? I just didn't know my numbers, right? But instead of me crying and, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I'm not making that much money as I thought I was going to do. Like all those things that people would have done. I'm like, how do we fix it? How do we fix this? Tom Howard comes in. He's like, do you even know what a P&L is? I'm like, I know what it is, but I don't know how to read it. <laughs> right. And he taught me my financials. Three, he, I think he was there for 30 days, 45 days. Taught me my financials. Right. I dedicated myself to, to learning my numbers. Dude, all I was doing wrong was I, I was I was I was I was priced improperly, which ninety nine percent of contractors are. The fear they have so much fear of like, well, well the customer's not going to buy a fifteen thousand Ishmael. The customer's not going to buy a twenty thousand Ishmael. Right? That's the same fear I had in two thousand nineteen. I was selling systems for nine grand, a thirty million dollar business selling systems at nine thousand, ten thousand dollars in Southern California, the most expensive market. All those were mistakes that I made early on but we were able to pivot quick. You know what I did when I found out that we were repriced improperly? Raised your prices. In, the, in a second. <laughs> it, it didn't take me months. It didn't take me three months to talk to my ops manager to go to take a survey for my clients, see if they would pay more. Like, no, 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 no. Tom told me, hey, Ishmael, 
there's two things, there's three things that you need to work on, like ASAP. Your overhead's way too high, your marketing spend's way too high, and your price out, your price out way too low. I'm like, cool. That's the easiest three fixes of my life, okay? I had to let go of some people because I, I was overstaffed, right? Had to let go of some people. That happened the same day, Brian. Uh, I was underpriced by, you know, a lot of money. So I raised my prices the same day and I hire a controller to start tracking all my, all my numbers. That same day, all those decisions were made. You know how long it would have taken a regular contractor or contractors that, that doubt themselves to do those little three decisions? Right. Months and months and months and months. Right. By the well, time you, they know it, they're like, you know how many but, shops Tom Howard has been to, to do that. And they still haven't yes. done it. They've still not made those changes. It, it, yes. The dude, Tom Howard told, told, told me himself. He's like, dude, I went to a shop six months ago. They still don't know. They still don't want to drop the marketing campaigns that I told them were inefficient. We cleaned up my service time that we started tracking my marketing properly. I'll give you a perfect example. I was spending $1.1 million at the LA Times. $1.1 million thinking that I'm the hot shot putting one page ads on the LA Times, not tracking the numbers. You know, n- none of that. Knowing that I was in front of, dude, we were, I think at, out of the 1.1, we produced like 2.4, $2.3 million. That's a really bad wow. ROI. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's an expensive and marketing we, campaign. <laughs> it is. And guess what we did? We dropped the LA Times that same day. And that's what I keep telling people, man. The, the next thing happened, Brian, and they, the next thing happened because the decisions were made the decisions were made, whether they were good or bad, they were made. And we reached the outcome faster than people would, 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 would normally reach. So, so yeah, man, there's a, there's a lot of things that I did wrong, you know, but at the end of the day, I've always known that, that, that I, that I love next gen, that I love the people that worked in there. So that's, I think that's why God kept me afloat, kept me insane. Right. So it, it was, it, it did, it's a, it's a dope journey, man. So isn't it true though, that like sometimes our pride gets in the way of our own success? You know, you're talking yeah. about putting something yeah. on the front of the LA Times saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is big stuff yeah. here. Right. And all the, all the while not realizing or not being willing to entertain the idea that maybe this actually isn't a good thing. Yeah. And, th- and then you kind of yeah. wake up to it at some point. So like our audience is primarily made up of a lot of technicians. I know we have a lot of owners that listen to, but a lot of technicians, you know, in your experience through all the ranks that you've held in all the different businesses, where did pride come into play? Was it your asset and your ally or was it your adversary? It was, it was, it was, I was so focused on, uh, and, and this was the part of my drinking. When, when I was, when I was growing next year, the first three years of next year, I was drunk half of the time. And, 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 and me being drunk let, gets my ego out, gets my pride out. I was so focused on home comfort and how, how he betrayed me and how he, how he did me wrong and all the things that, that I was focused on. Right. And he was always on the LA times. He was always on the orange County register. He was always on magazines. He was always on that. And I tried to do the same thing as him just to show him that I was better than him because I was trying, it was an ego thing, right? Not tracking properly, not knowing that, that I wasn't converting properly, like not doing the, the business savvy things that I should have been doing. And, and, and part of it was my drinking and part of it was just not knowing my numbers. So yeah, man, it's, 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 it's it's a lot of uh, these owners, uh, and I talk to thousands of owners. Do that if you go on my Facebook page on, on Service Avengers, or if you go through my DMs, I probably have easily over ten thousand DMs easily. And and I talk to them, Brian, and it's the same thing. Like they're they're scared to raise the prices. They're scared to fire the the the, the person that's been working there for ten years and, and you know milking a high salary. They're scared. They're 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 just scared to make decisions. And, and, and I tell the owners, that, uh, I tell every single owner the same thing. And like, guys, you guys are one decision away from being good. You guys are just too scared to make that decision. Is that what it is? Is it fear? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, the what ifs. What if you find that superstar? What if yeah. you what if you hire that, yeah. you know, that person who's going to sell more than you've ever seen before and break all the records? Yep. But on the other yep. side of that equation, you hear people saying, well, what if they, you know, leave here and, and steal our stuff and go to another company. And, right. and, and what if we right. run into debt and then the bank calls our loan and, and what about all this stuff? So how do we balance those what ifs? Because they're pretty severe in both directions. There, there is. And then that, that's what I'm saying. Like the, the, because, because we, you are, you are, you get the outcome so quick, the loss is so minimal. Now, the, if you take years and years to make that decision, you're losing money in those years. But if you take that quick decision of, hey, I found out this marketing company, this marketing campaign doesn't work and make the decision of switching it, the losses are way less than if you just keep letting it ride and keep letting it ride and keep letting it ride like I did, right? 
We weren't making money because I wasn't making the decision that I should have been following the numbers on. We were following the pride. We were following, oh, I'm, I'm in the front of the Orange County Register. I'm in the front of the LA Times, which back in the day, digital wasn't big, right? And everybody was on print. So, so I felt like I was the king of the world just for pride. It wasn't for, for the business, right? But it's, but it's making, <clears throat> it's making those decisions, Brian, quick enough so you can know the result, not dragging it along two, three years. Keeping that that technician that's not performing, that's costing you money. Ishmael, keeping you, that sales guy that's not selling, that's costing you money. Keeping that office personnel that keeps, you know, the culture bad inside of the, the office, that's costing money. And you guys got to make those decisions of, do I want to keep going that route or do I want to switch a company around? Money is absolutely something that, uh, you know, everybody listening, whether they're in a truck or behind a desk is always concerned about not only personal income, but the solvency of every business to make sure that there is a future tomorrow for them to come work at, right? Course. And you do of a course, lot. Man. You do a lot of, uh, you know, we'll call it hustling. You know, you're out there. You're on social media quite a bit, encouraging people, helping them, you know, overcome their fears. And we've actually uh, done a little bit of polling ourselves to ask uh, some of those people what questions, if they had you in a room, uh, that they would ask nice. to you. And so Brian has a couple of those to pose from from your group, no less, from the Service Avengers group on Facebook. Right. So if if you're not a member of that group, jump in there and get accepted, and you'll hear stuff like this. Literally every day, people just posting and answering each other's questions and stuff. We, we throw episodes of this in there from time to time. So, uh, it's an one, amazing group. It's an amazing group, by the way, guys. The one, yes, I agree. One, it was actually the first, uh, this was the first industry group I ever joined because, oh, uh, dope. Brent Buckley was like the, f- uh, I want to say he was like, I don't know what it was, like the 10th episode we did or something two years ago. And, um, I was talking to him maybe before he came on about coming on and he said, he's done a bunch of podcasts and I'm like, what podcasts? I didn't know there were trade podcasts, you know? And he put me on to like, to the point and J dubs podcast, which I love both of those podcasts. Um, yep. and that's how I got onto Tommy's podcast, which I love as well. And, uh, Tommy Mello. And then, um, he said, what about these groups? How much do you know about these groups? And this was actually on the show. He told me about there being these amazing, uh, high level groups and yours was the first one he sent me an invite to. So, uh, yeah, so that was that was pretty cool. And ever since, I spend I spend time every day in these mastermind groups, trying to get myself better and trying to give advice to you know companies smaller than this one. So thank you for what you do in that group. And um, first one I wanted it to ask was by Terry Bloom. He said, "What are the top five books to read if you're starting a service business?" Dude, um, that is the wrong question you want to ask me. I've never ever read a book in my life. I, <laughs> I, I, I I've tried to. I try to sit down and, and I posted this like a book, couple months ago. I'm like trying to sit down and read a book because I've never, not once in my life, read a book. And everybody tells me these amazing stories about the, how they read books. And I just can't, like these words start moving, man. And I can't understand what they're saying. So I just, <clears throat> I've never read a book, man. I, I apologize for that question. Well, let, let me, let me uh, help <clears throat> from, from a uh, Detroit public school dropout here. Audio books, buddy. I'm not reading books either. Yeah, I need I need to start doing that honestly, especially when I'm driving to one of some of these branches. I need to start listening to some of the, some of these audio books. Yeah, that's for me. It's the drive to and from work, and then um, when I mow my lawn, I have a riding mower because I got a pretty pretty big yard to mow. Um, that's another time, and then sometimes when I'm working out, if I'm just feeling it that day on the weights, and I don't need music or anything to pump me up, I'm going to listen to an audio book. So yeah, there there is a lot. There's a ton to gain out of them in every aspect. I mean, you're a parent can always get better at even that by listening to an audiobook. Okay, Nate, yeah, do you no, want to throw gonna, one or two I'm out? I'm going to start the audiobooks for sure. Nate, do you want to throw a book out, buddy? Extreme Ownership, man. That's a great place to start, in my opinion. Jocko Willink. Yeah. I'll say uh, for, for the people listening to this podcast, you can't go wrong with the Michael Gerber, Ken Goodrich, um, E-Myth Revisited HVAC companies. I've, a- heard, I've heard amazing stories about that E-Myth one. So yeah, and, and big ups to Ken, because every time I talk to Ken, he's probably one of the first, one of the few people in this whole industry that I can sit down with them for 5, 10, 15 minutes and have a conversation with them. And I leave out of that conversation thinking exactly what I need. Like, he gets my brain going, man, of, of where we need to head, how the industry is going. So big ups to Ken, man. He's, a, he's been a great mentor of mine. Yeah, he was, he kind of got me started in this line of work. So yeah, same to me. Um, nice. We'll, we'll skip on to uh, Enrique Mendez from your group. Right now is slow, nice. and I know everybody is slow. Every contractor mm-hmm. says they're busy, probably not with full staff, though. And with so many employees at NextGen, what do you do when there's nothing to do in terms of like weather-driven business? 
Um, there's actually, even though we're slow, um, there's a huge team of CSRs and in, 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 in-house support that is constantly doing outbound. It's slow in the, in the sense that there's not a demand call. Like there's demand calls coming in, but not as many, right? But we're still filling up the boards with outbounding. We're still filling up the boards because we're still consistent on our marketing, right? It's not just because it's slow and there's no demand. I pulled down all the marketing. Actually, uh, I, if you see our marketing budget, and I don't mind posting our marketing budget, if you see our marketing budget, for the first Q1 and Q4 of, of, um, of 2023, our marketing budget is almost, uh, I want to say in the mid double digits um, for Q1 and Q4. And then we dip it down on Q2 and Q3 just because the demand gets there. So the, the consistency of marketing gives us, gives us calls. Um, the outbounding gives us calls. And then obviously, you know, I think we've touched 100 in, in the last seven years, probably 160, 150,000 people's houses. So, so all those people, you know, we've, we've luckily kept a really, really good online um, review image. Our customer experience is still there. So all those people still need us for plumbing, for, for their air conditioning, for the heater when it does get cold. So yes, it's low. What I would, what I, what I would advise people that don't, that don't have the marketing budget that we do, that don't have the workforce that we do to be doing the outbound is stay consistency at least in, 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 in your marketing, right? Because if you pull out of your marketing just because it's slow, it's going to get even slower, right? So, so, so consistency in the marketing number two, like all those people's houses, even if you're a mom and pop shop, you at least touch a thousand people, 5,000 people, grab the freaking phone and pick up the phone and, and start calling those people. Hey, we got to do your tuna before summer gets here. Hey, we got to do your tuna before, before summer gets here. And we, and we, and we, and we blast that into the whole company. We got to make sure we take care of those people before the summer gets here. Cause once summer gets here, we're not going to be able to get to 150,000 people's homes. Right. So, so I would say stay consistent with your marketing. Get some out, get get some outbounding going on so you can fill up the board. And and when you're at the customer's house, it's not trying to sell them something. It's not trying to always upsell them, sell, 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 sell. sell. It's just finding a solution. Hey, have you heard about this air scrubber? Hey, have you heard about this UV light? And keep bringing it up to them because eventually you're going to educate them so much on why they need it, right? And 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 and, and eventually they're going to make the decision of buying that. So IEQ is big uh, in the off season for us. Outbounding, making sure you know. We give everybody fair opportunities, not just because you're a level four technician pulling the best numbers in the whole company. You're going to get all the calls. Like everybody's got to get at least one or two or three calls every single day. So um, for the mom and pop shops, I would I would definitely, definitely tell them to stay consistent, even if it's a small marketing budget. And 100% have one or two people outbounding all day booking appointments for you guys, making sure your, t- your technicians are at least inside the home. So Jonathan, great answer ish. And I, I agree. Actually, I, I did want to interject when you said with the IAQ thing, it's, it's you, it's so crucial that every tech that goes out brings it up again, because you're oh, yeah. the, way, the way you said that you're creating a, a, a real authoritative um, look for the next tech. And even for yourself, you yep. might, you might be the fourth one and techs can read the history, you know, in service Titan or success where Sarah, whatever they're on, they yep. can see the history and they go, Yep. Oh, the last three people did it. I'm not even going to bring it up. But you don't understand how much credibility is being built by by of course. professional technician after professional technician doing that. And also at that and point, I, I, something like a feel felt found is really powerful, which is to say. And I, I, I've and, had, and I, Brian, I, tell, I tell the technicians this all the time, like, guys, just because the last two technicians went in there, try to inform them of, about an air scrub, a UV light, an eye wave whatever it is that they were informed, doesn't mean that like they, they might hear something you say that catches their attention that the other two technicians didn't say, and they're going to get it from you. Exactly. And your personality might just be a better fit. There is always that too. Exactly. There you go. That's half of that's half of the battle right there is number one, presenting the product so they can know what we have. Number two, the personalities, like the last two technicians could have been having a rough day or maybe not as interactive. You walk in there with a smile and good energy and inform them about this highway. Well, guess what? They might buy from you. Yeah. It might be time to pull the trigger. Like enough said. Exactly. So I, I real exactly. quick so wanted to touch on the, uh, the feel felt found, which is something I've wanted to talk about for a few episodes and I keep forgetting, but you just reminded me of it, which is, and, and right. you want to jot this down, feel felt found uh, audience members, especially if you're in sales is to say, I completely understand how you feel. I had a client of ours who actually lives pretty close to you who felt the exact same way. Once they got the product installed, this is what they found. And this is how they feel now. Feel felt found. Right. It's a beautiful strategy right. to, to uh, build commonality. It's just a third party story thing, but it's uh, it's very powerful. We don't talk about it enough on here, but thanks buddy. That's so cool. Jonathan Nevez uh, said something I'm very passionate about ish. 
What do you think we can do nationally to help bring awareness to the trades for more minorities to change communities and help reduce the wealth gap? We have to educate the, the minorities because nobody you know this is the number one problem that I've been trying to solve for this message since this day one. If you ever hear me speak in front of a thousand people, two thousand, whatever, wherever I'm at, I always tell them the number one thing we all have to work on. Okay, the number one problem in the whole trade is not the fucking mom and pop shop. It's not that we're overpriced, underpriced. It's not none of that. The number one problem in the trades as a whole, nobody wants to be a plumber. Nobody wants to be an air conditioning tech. Nobody wants to be an electrician. Nobody wants to be none of that because they don't know. They don't know that one of the 22-year-old plumber just started his first year last year and made $120,000 at action. Nobody knows that. We know that. Trade people know that. But we all need to unite and amplify that message of, hey, guys, there's a huge future for everybody at the trades. Men, women, black, white, Mexican, whatever it is, there's a huge future. You can make a ton of money in the trade. Once we amplify that message, Brian, once we tell every, once everybody in the trades unites and says that to minorities, to everybody, that's when we're going to have an influx of labor. Right now, we're trying to beg people to come work for us. We, we get lucky if a technician walks into to our shop. We get lucky if we get two or three technicians from school to come and apply at our, uh, at our job. Now, imagine if hundreds of thousands of people wanted to be plumbers and technicians and installers and, and sales guys in, in the trade. What do you think that would do for the trades? Why do you think everybody wants to work at, why do you think Google is so popular? Amazon, Facebook, why do you think service time? Why do you think all these tech companies are so huge? Because everybody wants to be that. Everybody wants to grow the next technology company. Everybody wants to work at Facebook. Everybody wants to work at Google. They don't have a labor problem, <laughs> right? No, they we got have people, a labor problem. They got people lined up on the porch to Google trying to get in there. They got people lined up from here to San Francisco of trying to get into Google. They have a waiting list of people trying to get into their, their company. Imagine if that was for the trades. What, what, you know that technician that we've been trying to, that, that, that's been called no, that no called no show through two, three times, and he's still working for you because you don't have nobody else? That guy would be gone and be replaced with a better person. Now imagine what that would do, the sophistication it would do to the trait. It would be a beautiful thing. That's what we need to focus on. Absolutely. That's what we need to focus on. That's what we need to focus on as a whole, not just as next gen, not just as uh, as a ghetto or as an ARS, none of that. As a whole, we all unite and say the same thing. Hey guys, come and join us. This is where the money's at. This is where the future's at. This is where good culture's at. And we start getting an influx of people applying, the trades would be a whole different world. If the only, trades would be if only we had a podcast out there that just tried to make the yes. trades sexy every week. You know? <laughs> if only yes. that podcast existed and it was called Waste No Day. If only. <laughs> right? Imagine if we could amplify this message uh, and waste no days, if we could amplify to ten million people out there, twenty million, fifty million. Imagine if Joe Rogan went and said, hey guys, the plumbers are making them killing. You guys should all join them. And they started joining us. That would be dope. That would be dope. So, uh, so that's great. A, that's, yep. that's, 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 hopefully I answered that question for Jonathan, but that, that's the Absolutely. number one problem we got to, we, we got to unite and, 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 and say the same message to everyone. Look, we, we all know where they're at. Like in, in your neighborhood, in your community, you know where to find minorities, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. Go talk to them. That's the answer. Yep. Like go talk to yep. them. They're not hard to Go find to any demographic nope. you want to find, you know where to find them. And you really yep. have to be out there seeing and meeting with them. Like we want, we here want young uh, kids in like trade school, right? Like it's the, yep. the, the best step from nothing to a plumber, electrician or HVAC tech. So what do we do? Of course. We, we bring their, we bring the classes into our building we spend an yep. entire Friday with them. We feed them breakfast and lunch. We take great care of their instructors. So they want to keep doing it over and over and over again. Yep. And then when they graduate every May, we have our pick of that team. We get whoever we want out of that yeah. class. But the, pro the, the problem is, right, and that's an amazing freaking solution. And, I, and, and we're, we've, we've done that at Nexion for quite a, a couple of years already. But how many trade schools is there in every city? One? How many colleges and, and schools are in there in every city? Hundreds of thousands? Like, that's the problem. Imagine if we had the same amount of trade schools as we had colleges and schools. It would be insane. Or if we go to high schools. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, this, so there's a lot of solutions. We There's a lot of solutions we can do. The problem is nobody's really doing it. And, and, and I've said this before. Uh, 
to people. By the time I'm 40, I'm clocking out of the trades. But as of uh, after 40, my message is the same message. I'm going to go out there and start telling people how much wealth and how much how cool the trades are, man. How old are you? Uh, 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 35 ish. Sorry. Um, 35. So I remember, I remember, yes, uh, the first time I ever heard your voice or heard anything about you outside of your group was on uh, J dubs podcast, where I heard you say that you were, you will not rest until Netflix does a documentary about you. How's that going? Uh, just the same, the, the same message still, man. I'm not resting until Netflix does a special on this. So the people can know that the trade is where it's at. Love it. I love that. That's, uh, you know, that's bold. That's thinking big, man. Of course, and, man. Of course, I'm trying to help everybody, not just a couple cities here in Los Angeles. Man, I'm trying to help out everybody. So Sam Merzea wanted to know, he would love to hear about your growth stages from zero to a million, one million to five million and so forth. What obstacles you had to overcome and what was implemented to achieve the goals? I think, I think we kind of covered the majority of that, but certainly the, uh, and John Wenman from uh, Maryland kind of asked the same question, like wh- how did his was a little bit different where it was uh, in the webinar and service Titan. You said you did a million dollars your first month licensed out of your garage. So they're asking kind of the same thing. How did you go from that zero to 1 million mark? But just the, the marketing, right? Like I knew that there was no way to grow if people didn't know who I was and what I did. Right. So I took a huge risk, right? At the end of the day, the risk on, on just pouring the, all the money that was coming into the company, the company, whether it was a dollar, five dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, uh, a half a million dollars, every single penny that got back into the company went right back out into marketing and recruiting and making sure we got more vans and making sure our shop was like, and, and then that's the second biggest choice that the, that business owners have to make. Okay. The first, the first, everybody knows the first, the first biggest choice they got to make. They, the first biggest choice is they got to get into the business. Okay. They got to drop their part-time job or their full-time job and start and start actually paying attention to their business. The second choice that they, they got to make is that, right? They got to make sure that once the money starts producing and once you start selling one or two or three systems, that you don't just go grab that money and go buy a, a car, a personal car, or go buy, you know, um, take a vacation on, on, no, like the early stages, the infancy stages of the business, all the energy, all the attention, and all the money goes right back into the business. The reason why we grew to a million dollars our first the couple months, we did our, our first million dollars, it's because we were selling, we were advertising the systems, we were, we were pouring every single dollar that got back in and pouring it back into marketing because I knew that if I spent, you know, let's say $25,000 and it got me a hundred calls. Well, dude, if I spend $50,000, it's going to give me 200 calls. And if I spend a hundred thousand dollars, give me five, like, you know what I'm saying? So it was just keep spending all the money back in there. The problem with 99% of the majority of these owners is that they see the money coming in. And once they see that, you know, there's a hundred, there's 500, there's a million dollars in the bank account, they start cruising. They're like, oh, I'm good, man. I, I got it. I got money in the bank. The, the business is flowing. Uh, they, they start getting comfortable. They stop making decisions. They start ignoring the business because they, they, they're just comfortable. Dude, we're not, uh, next year I was never comfortable. There was never a stage where I was like, okay, this is enough. Even at a hundred million dollars, I said this since day one, I want to be the fastest growing company, plumbing HVAC or a contractor in the nation get to get to a hundred. Now that I got to a hundred, I got a different goal. I want to get to 250. And once I get to 250, I'm going to get to 500, right? But it's never comfortable. It's never, it's never, well, let me grab all this money and go buy some. No, man. It's, it's making sure that every single penny that comes into the business is reinvested back into people, to marketing, to a bigger space, to more van, like to the company itself. Beautiful. Which is made up of the people themselves. Yes. Trent, man. Trent Jackson in your group asked, is there a negative to growing too fast? Yes. Yes, there is. Not knowing your numbers is the biggest negative that you're going to, that you're going to, that you're going to, that you're going to up into. I should have hired a financial controller five. Well, I grew too fast, but I should have hired a financial controller year one. Most contractors that are between two to $10 million should be hiring a controller part-time or full-time type of operation so they could start structuring their balance sheet, so they could start structuring their P&Ls and their financials, and they could start doing a cash flow statement. They should hire those. Uh, they should start uh, structuring their accounting team, whether you're two, three, four, five, ten, twenty million $20 million. You need to know your freaking numbers. 
That's the biggest mistake I made on action was there's two mistakes I made on action. One, I wasn't priced out properly and actually three mistakes now that I think about it. I wasn't priced out properly. I wasn't paying people enough. Okay, listen to that because I'm going to get back. To that. I wasn't paying people enough. I wasn't priced out properly and I didn't know my numbers. Okay, so there is a huge headache of growing too fast and not knowing your numbers. Now, if knowing what I know now, I guarantee you, you drop me in Mississippi. You drop me in Alaska. You drop me in Arizona. Okay, give me a hundred bucks, drop me in Arizona. I'll grow a $25 million business in two years. Knowing what I know now, it's, it's, it's the numbers. Knowing that, hey, you got to pay these people more. I started making more money, Brian. I started making the most money. Nexion started making the most money ever when I started paying people more. Let that sink in. I started making more money when I stopped negotiating labor, when I stopped nickel and diming my people, when I stopped trying to pay less commission, when I stopped trying to pay, pay less hourly for installs, when I stopped doing that and I started paying people good and I started walking them in and, and not negotiating with their skills and their labor and actually paying what they were worth, right? When I started doing that, that's when the whole world changed for me. That's when everybody started coming into action. That's, dude, in, in seven years, we grew to $100 million. We've never had a recruiter. We've never had a, a budget for recruitment. People just come in and apply. That's insane. And it's exactly where you want to be, where you have a line outside oh. the front door like Google. Of course, man. Of course. So, People come yeah, in man, and apply. There is, a, there is an upside to, to, to growing too fast. If you don't know your numbers, that's the, biggest, that's the biggest downside to it. But if you know your numbers, there's no such thing as growing too fast. It's how capable are you of growing the business? How fast do you want to go, right? It's like driving a car, right? Once you have the car and everything set in place and you know exactly how much fuel you have, you know when the tune-up was done. You know how how, many, how much tire you have on the car. Like you know all that. How fast do you want to go, right? But if you don't have, if you don't know the pressure tires, if you don't know how much gas you have, if you don't know when, when the last tune-up was done, if you don't know nothing inside that car, of course you're not going to freaking go anywhere, right? Or even you're even be worse, to do anything. if you have no idea where you're going. Exactly, exactly right there. I I've, I've had a plan since day one to get to a hundred million dollars, the fastest, healthiest way possible. Right. And it's not for everybody. Some people, dude, there's nothing wrong with a $10 million business, a ten, five, $10 million business, having a beautiful staff and the culture and everything feels like a, a family. Like there's yeah. nothing wrong with that operation, man. Not everybody has to get to a hundred or 200. A lot of people are making great money. Yes. At $10 million, bro, you could put 22, 24% on the bottom all day. So last but not least, and I know uh, you're a busy man and we don't want to keep you over our allotted time here. Jose Romero asked a question that I thought uh, was a perfect question to end on. Family is probably the main reason why we do this. How do you yep. stay in a present state for them, especially trying to build the enterprise in the early in the early stages of growth? I had I had I had one of the best. Um, I have one. Of, I have one of the best mentors. I had some of the best mentors in the industry mentor me, and luckily they've been good good people to, to me, and they helped me a lot. But this one. This one advice really stuck to me, and I, and that's when I started really enjoying my life. That's when I really started, you know, seeing the big picture of what this is all about. And and I heard this, and I and I'll never forget this. Hey, when you're one of my mentors told me, when you're working, you know, work. When you're at the gym, work out. When you're with your family, be with your family. Oof. When you're eating, eat. When you're smiling, enjoy that smile. When you're sad, enjoy that too. I started segmenting my life. To if I'm at work, man, I'm at work. Don't call me. Don't t the, nothing. I'm at work. I need to be focused at work. I need to make decisions. I need to make sure the companies. But I'm at work. I'm not at work thinking what's going on at home, thinking what's going on at golf, thinking what's going on in, in, with my buddies if, if they're hanging out. And I'm not. I'm not doing that no more. I used to do that. Now, if I'm at work, I'm a hundred percent at work. My phone's in my pocket. I'm enjoying my people. I'm having conversations with my CFO, with my controller, with my GM, with my president, all those guys. But I'm at work. If I'm with my girls, with my wife and my girls at what at a restaurant, my phone's on silent. It's in my pocket, and I don't want to talk to nobody because I'm in that moment. And once I started really, really doing that, and this has been barely been maybe a year and a half, two years that I started doing that, my whole life changed. Because now I'm 100% focused wherever I'm at. If I'm at the gym, I'm working out at the gym. I'm listening to my music. I'm working on my body. I'm working on me. But that's 100% me. I'm not thinking about work, what's going on over there. I'm not calling my CFO and asking where the number. I'm not doing none of that. I'm not checking to see where the, 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 the numbers are at for the day. I'm not doing none of that. I'm at the gym. I'm working on myself. I'm working on my body. As soon as I'm done with the gym, if I go back to work or if I go pick up my girls from dance, 
and I got to see a dance rehearsal from them, I'm enjoying every moment of that dance rehearsal. So once I started doing that, that's when everything kind of started falling into place to me. Love it, Ish. And that's really uh, great uh, uh, sound easy. advice. Like too. it. Like it. <laughs> no, man, that's, that's good <laughs> stuff there. And, and sh- kudos to you for being the CEO of a you know, $100 million plus organization and having that mindset. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, got, I, I got in trouble last, literally last night watching uh, a show with my wife and older two children where I was on the phone. So we have these groups growing. We had some crazy stuff happen at the shop yesterday that we won't get into, but um, we had some crazy stuff happen and I'm texting, picking it up, answering texts, putting it back down, picking it up. She just took my phone. We have like a, a, a long sectional couch in the, in the basement where we watch movies together and she slid my phone under the Good couch job. where I couldn't reach. <laughs> good job. And, you know uh, what you should do to your wife next time she does that? Tell her, thank you. Thank you, honey. And give her a good hug because that's what you need to do. You need to pay attention to it what, what, when you're in the moment. It is like that, man. It is like, uh, I need something to correct me when I'm, you know, like a dog who's, who's getting just too crazy about something and you just got to take it away from him or correct him. Yes, sir. I need to yes, be sir. corrected sometimes. Just put back on the path of, Hey, I'm not at my desk right now. I'm at there the house. Go. Yank the leash. Everybody, everybody does that, Brian. Everybody does that, Nate. So, hey, guys, honestly, super dope podcast. I love the questions, and and hopefully we were able to help some people with some of the questions that they had. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this as long as God gives me life, and, 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 and hopefully we helped out some people today. Huh? Oh, absolutely, man. God bless you for taking your time and coming on the show. We look forward already to having you on again, and we'll see you in your group, man. Thanks a lot, Appreciate Ish. it, man. Take, take care, guys. What a great podcast with Ish and what an inspiration he is to so many. Uh, he's just embodies the spirit of a hustler. You know, nothing's going to stop him and he has such big plans and dreams and he is succeeding at them every single day. Uh, we appreciate that inspiration here and uh, kudos to Ish for having not only a great idea for what the trades can be, but also how to balance that with his life and what he wants to be as a man and a family man. We hope that this podcast was inspirational to you and maybe you have to make some changes or dream bigger wherever you are right now. Uh, we want to keep challenging you in that way. And of course, our daily and weekly challenge is the same, which is to choose to wake up every single morning and waste no day. 